uh, Harold Varmus and I and a few others uh, went down to the White House in the Oval Office and were briefing uh, Vice President Gore and President um, uh, Clinton about HIV AIDS. I was actually showing him a, uh, a now famous picture that's been circulated around the community because I've given it to some of the people to show of my explaining what CCR5 is and how the virus binds to CD4 and then changes its conformation and goes to CCR5. And, and, and as part of it, I, I told him this has really important relevance for, for the development of a vaccine because it's those cryptic and then exposed epitopes that we can't seem to make a good immune response against. And uh, as we were walking out to go into the Rose Garden to have a little press uh, briefing about the visit, uh, the president asked Harold Varmus and I, we were walking out, I remember walking out the door and saying, so what is it that you really do need uh, that I can help you with? I said, well, what we really need is we really need to accelerate our effort on a vaccine development. And the best way we can do that is to have an entity which is essentially self-contained, where we can go from fundamental basic research right up through and including the early phases of testing a vaccine. Because we have basic researchers who have no capability of doing this. We have people who do this well, who don't really get involved in the basic research. If we could get a critical mass of the best people in one place physically, first here on campus and then perhaps even in the extramural community, that would be a big contribution. And one of the good things about that is that when you talk to the President of the United States, he'll turn around, I think it was Leon Panetta at the time, I forgot who, who had, but I'm pretty sure it was Leon Panetta, he said, we should make this happen right now. Uh, and uh, Greg Simon, who was the advisor and one of the chief assistants to Vice President Gore was there also. And they said, okay, what do you do? Well, we need permission to build a building. We need funds to build a building. And uh, we're going to have to recruit some serious scientists, mostly from the outside. So they said, do it. Chavi came about, actually. We had that uh, first meeting of what ultimately became the HIV vaccine enterprise that Rick Klausner and I and Larry Corey and a bunch of people were involved with when we met in uh, Airly House, I believe it was, in Virginia, in, uh, uh, to get people in the field and outside of the field together to talk about the fact that we need to rethink what we're doing with vaccine. And again, was this ever-progressive realization that there's so much discovery that needs to be done. I can't overestimate how that was an evolving concept. Even at the time that we were doing things in period, it was evolving that there were so many things that we needed to discover. So we analyzed, we discussed, we presented, uh, and we came up with some recommendations of things that needed to be done. Uh, it was ultimately published in a, in a now very well quoted article in science that we were all uh, co-authors on, a whole group of us who were involved with it. Um, and one of the things that were recommended were to have centers modeled in an extramural way and in a collaborative way with what we had done with the VRC and to have a center that would examine a very specific problem, maybe a center involved in developing immunogens, a center involved in this, a center involved in that. And one of them was a center involved in the immunology, which we still don't understand, of HIV. How do you make an immune response? Why don't we make an appropriate immune response? So that was in the model of things that needed to be done. So we had a big competition, a lot of very, very good people uh, applied. The applications were terrific and in a peer-reviewed way, the way things happen with NIH funding. The uh, Bart Haynes, as the PI of that, actually had the score that was clearly the top score, and that's how we got Chavi. This was in the fall sometime, September of 07, perhaps, I think. I was sitting at my desk, and I got a phone call from Larry Corey. Uh, and Larry, he sounded like he had been hit by six trucks. He, I've never heard him sound so badly. He says, Tony, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. And I said, well, 
try me. And he did. He said, there's nothing there. There's not even a hint or a whiff of any effect on the set point. And besides, brace yourself, it looks like there may even be an increased risk among some of the people, particularly those with high adeno virus titus. And we hadn't even gotten into the circumcised versus uncircumcised because the data had not been analyzed. So Larry was the first one to tell me, and he was really very down about it, saying, I can't believe the first look and it didn't work. This is terrible. The, the, I think the impact of this study was that although some of us, myself included, and several of my colleagues were, were really uh, less than cautiously optimistic. Uh, we, we, we were hoping that we would see some signal there that would allow us to build on the next generation of a similar type of a vaccine. We didn't expect on the first look at the data, essentially abject lack of success, as well as the specter of a risk associated with people who have a certain background, namely antibody background. So that was sobering, to say the least. And what that did for us was, I think, the, the I wouldn't say the straw that broke the camel's back, because the camel's back has not been broken. It was that which pushed us to the point of saying, time out, folks. We don't know why very few people develop robust responses of neutralizing antibody. And we don't know why the immune system is incapable of mounting a response that with most any other virus would ultimately be protective. So what we did after the STEP study was saying what we've really got to do, and we did this at a meeting that was held in March of 2008, right outside of Bethesda at the NIH, where we brought in a group of people who were involved in the field, who had really been laboring at this for some time, as well as some newer people with new ideas. And we said, and I got up when I gave the in in introduction, and says, we're going to turn the knob now not that we're going to stop doing vaccine research, because there were some people who inappropriately were saying, this is it, we might as well not do any vaccine research, which was beyond inappropriate. That's the absolute wrong response. The right response is to continue to do research, but to do it with a different frame of mind. And that is to turn the knob from development back to discovery. And since natural infection has improved the concept, we've got to do better than natural infection. And that's why we're starting to see a retuning of the, of the models, the animal models, concentrating on how you can induce neutralizing antibody, identifying by crystallographic analysis what those neutralizing epitopes are and determining how we can get an immunogen to actually induce that. that really there was a lot of um, discouragement among people and my job was to not downplay the fact that this was not uh, a positive result, but to remind them that that is the nature of research. Research is fundamentally a bunch of failures with an occasional bright light of a success. So that's not necessarily something that's surprising for someone who's done research all their life. Every year that goes by, 2.7 million people get infected. So there's a lot of a passion in wanting to do something about it, particularly in the arena of prevention. I would say that people ask me, are you down, are you really depressed about this result? And I look at them and say, what are you talking about depressed? This is not an emotional issue. This is science. It's strictly business. It's nothing personal. So I don't get depressed about it. I say, where do we go from here? days of the empiric, give me a product and I'll test it in a big trial, essentially are over. That doesn't mean that clinical trials are over because clinical research and clinical trial in a patient can be part of discovery. A big empiric clinical trial of thousands of people, when you don't know what it is that you're looking for, that really isn't part of discovery. And looking at the data, I believe that there's enough difference not knocking me off my seat, but enough difference and enough, I would say, advantage, if you want to use that animal model, immunological response of PAVE compared to the STEP trial, that it warrants a truncated, lean but mean trial that's a small proof of concept trial.